All right, thank you for um, waiting a little bit. Uh, we wanted to make sure everyone got in from the weather and uh, from long distances. And so there may still be some people coming in from behind, but we figured we would get started and welcoming you here. Um, right. <laughs> oh, you uh, yeah, just put that back. There's Tim. <laughs> um, so I have a feeling that many of you already know um, Ed and Steve, um, given all the, the tags I see out there for um, the, the reception. So it's really, really wonderful to see you. Thank you for coming from wherever you came, some of them uh, long distances. Just wanted to take a moment to introduce uh, Trevor Smith and myself and welcome you to Pam. Uh, Trevor is the Associate Director of the Multisensory here at PAM and Curator of the Present Tense. I'm the Sarah Fraser Robbins Director of the Dottie Brown Art Nature Center and Curator of Natural History. And we've um, paired up on a number of projects and this has certainly been one of the most wonderful projects to be involved with, with both Steve and Ed. <laughs> so um, it's a delight to share this moment with you. We are so delighted to be up here with them. And uh, so Down to the Bone, which is the exhibition um, that we're going to be talking about today, is part of PEMS Climate and Environment Initiative, which is both exhibition-based and programming-based and institutionally-based. So we're really working on a multifaceted um, uh, strategy for how we are, um, what the, this time we are in and how we are going to go forward and what is the opportunity, but also the urgency of where we are right now. So really no project could be better than, than this one to be showcasing where we are. And so with that, um, just we thought we'd do a brief intro of, of Ed and Steve, and you all will likely know a lot more, but just so that everybody has a baseline before we uh, start off with, with their comments. Thank you, Janie. Um... Just, I will keep these introductions very brief, not because they aren't worthy of much longer <laughs> uh, descriptions, but uh, because I want us to be able to spend our time in, in conversation with you both. Uh, Ed Corrin is a visual artist and satirist who has, has been described as a, a dramatist of the Anthropocene. Um, he is, I believe the most published cartoonist in the history of the New Yorker and in May, almost no, up there. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. All right, but the longest. The longest. The longest. <laughs> there we go. And so, yeah. Yeah. Um, 60 years. The longest still function. Put it that way. <laughs> so, so that'll will be, be in May. It the 60th anniversary in May. Yeah. It, yeah. And yeah, that's great. And Steve Gorman, extraordinary landscape photographer, wildlife photographer, author, someone whose practice is really kind of documenting, I think, the cultural underpinnings of our relationship to nature and how we live in nature, how we live, live against nature sometimes. <laughs> Um, and it was really such an incredible honor and privilege to work with these two incredible artists who were also incredibly different artists coming, coming from diff different practices, but really kind of building off of these two artists' original insight that there was a, you know, like an incredible resonance going on between mm. your practices. And that's, I think, one of the things that we're going to explore this afternoon. So without further ado, let's, let's move into uh, the artist portion of, 
this afternoon. We'll start with uh, Ed, who who will who'll talk you through a little bit of his background and work. Yeah, I'll do that. Uh, what I want to do, first off, is uh, to kind of kick this off with the, the two sets of quotes. Uh, one inspirational that was written by Martin Luther King, which, I, and when I say inspirational, it means really that, that he is um, characterized the situation we find ourselves in now, even though he wrote it in 1967 at an address at the Riverside Church. Um, first thing is his take on basically where we are now. Um, he writes, there's no such thing as being too late. Procrastination is still the thief of time. Life often leads us standing bare, na uh, naked and dejected with a lost opportunity. We may cry out desperately for time to pause in its passage, but time is deaf to every plea and rushes on over the bleached bones and jumbled residue of numerous civilizations are written the pathetic words, too late. That's number one. Number two, I want to, it's an idea I wanted to throw out for general consideration as we proceed through the afternoon, which is the notion of artists as activists <clears throat> is what we can do, if anything. So there are two quotes, one from I, I, Y, Y, A, Y, Y, how did I, I can't never pronounce it. Ai Weiwei, sorry, um, about uh, his own reaction, to be sure. Um, let me just, oh, sorry. There we go. Um, he has said if my art has nothing to do with people, pain and sorrow, what is art for? And secondly, a wonderfully um, evocative and interestingly vague statement by William Kentridge, the great Australian artist uh, who has done so many different practices in his lifetime. And he says that he, and I connect with this very, very deeply, he is interested in a political art that is to say, an art of ambiguity, contradiction, uncompleted gestures, and unknown, uncertain endings. So that's the context in which my afternoon is based on. So, um, I mean, one of the things that is always a puzzle is, to me, as well as other people, is how do I as a cartoonist, a satirist, somebody who makes fun of human frailty, deal with these, this human tragedy and animal tragedy and world tragedy. So that's another part of the context. These are cartoons that have I've been involved with. I mean, the context, the, the um, content of our, the way we live and the connectivity climate we all face on a very mundane daily basis. Um, we'll read the captions because it somehow gives them a little life. Uh, on the left, it's uh, tell them how hard we've worked to protect their habitat. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the one on the right, if, I don't know if you can see this the, clearly, but it's a, clearly a kitchen young man, soccer player, talking to his mom saying, mom, listen to how much atmospheric pollution we produce just going to my soccer games. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, next, please. Uh, these three images are the photos of the dioramas of the Museum of Natural History uh, in the hall, I think of African mammals. And these are uh, a kind of inspiration for me over the years. I've studied them, looked at them when I was a kid. I say looked at them, studied them when I was a college student um, and 
came back to them in the 80s and started to do a series of drawings based on their, their kind of static, but e e eternal presence in the, in the world that they, at that time, when they, and they were all constructed in the third 20s and 30s and 40s uh, and installed then, uh, at that time, nature was immutable. It, we assumed nothing we were looking at would ever change. And the landscape would remain precisely the same. The vegetation, the animals in it, their vivacity, their life, all immutable. And as a base for what I have done since, which is a group of lithographs and drawings that you will see and have maybe have seen, um, they're based on the exact opposite. That, that, that it's all immutable and it's all fugitive and it's all ephemeral. And uh, so these two contrasts have inspired me quite a lot over quite a, quite a number of years. Next slide. Next, please, yeah. Um, drawings uh, in, that I did in 1980s. This was a very large drawing based on the dioramas and which reflect optimism and, and a kind of uh, endless eternal presence. Uh, next slide. Uh, this was taken at a print shop. You, you'll notice that the upstairs are, are lithographs as well as drawings. And I'm there signing a lithograph at a, a lithographic workshop in Paris uh, of stones I printed on this theme, starting way back with the uh, dioramas. And the, these are the, the children of, or grandchildren of the dioramas. Uh, next, please. Uh, these are drawings uh, paired uh, to some degree um, of based on what I've been thinking about for now, seven, eight years about collapse and mutability and where are we in this entire situation that we are now considering in, in the museum and everywhere else. The, the catastrophe, the tragedy, and to some degree, you may why ask humor as well as the tragedy of it. I mean, they're connected, very connected. Next, um, again, more. I mean, here are the animal, the, the companionship. The, it still endures between animal and who knows what. Uh, uh, and the same there, the bewilderment. The, you know, it's a, the surroundings of societal collapse and, uh, and it's a kind of a nod to Piranesi too and the, the collapse that he uh, drew both in the Veduta and also the, there were a series of drawings and prints he made. Uh, oh, I can't remember his name, but they're, they're, they have to do with all the detritus of a civilization fallen to shreds, as well as the death and dismemberment of it as well. Jolly topic. Anything else you want to say? That's the end of the slides. Yeah, know. I think I said it. Okay. <laughs> Good for you. Yeah. <laughs> so thanks for coming and braving the storm and being here. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. So you, you gather by now that we're not going to sugarcoat it. <laughs> we're in trouble. Um, and if you could show the first slide, please. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in trouble. <laughs> okay. So how did I get here? Um, I'm a photographer and a writer and a, basically an ethnologist who is... Uh, traveling to look for uh, solutions to the situation that we're in right now. But this journey of mine, this is up in northern Quebec on a subarctic canoe expedition uh, a couple of years ago, <coughs> trying to lift a canoe over a barricade of logs, just one of about a hundred that we had to, to do that. Um, this journey for me started about mm, a long time ago. It started when I was six years old. 
And it started not in the Quebec wilderness, but it started in Brussels, Belgium, all places. My father was an executive for an oil company, Texaco. He, um, he grew up, uh, he grew up um, a young man who was, his father was a factory foreman in Connecticut. He, was, he went to the World War II. He went to Yale and Harvard on the GI Bill. Um, particular interest in for an oil company, but that was the best job he could get. And um, in 1966, we moved over to Europe, to Brussels, which was the capital of Europe and um, the headquarters of NATO and the business capital. And we were there to bring the good news of American petroleum culture, suburbia, and consumerism. And we were going to implant that in Europe and around the world. And so um, I, though, as a, young, as a young kid, just was not interested in living in Europe. I wanted to be back in America where there were cowboys and Indians and pioneers and wilderness. And they were taking me to art museums. Oh, God, I hated that. They were dragging me from one art museum to another. My dad said that I set the world record for going through the Louvre in like five minutes. <laughs> anyway, I couldn't wait to get back here. And eventually we did, after five long years, we moved back to the United States. And um, it really wasn't what I had hoped it would be. Uh, that was about 1970, 71. And at that time we were going through this incredible post-war economic boom. And I don't know if you know this, but 80% of everything that's ever been built in the United States, buildings, schools, roads, hospitals, shopping malls, has been built since 1970. It's amazing, right? That's incredible. But that's what was happening. That was the United States that I came back to. And I was, they were building highways, the interstate highway system was moving in. Um, people were building you know, roads, suburban tracts. And I confronted my dad one night and I said, you know, what are you guys doing? I was, this is actually during the 79 oil crisis. And um, it seemed like the world was coming to an end because we were running out of oil. And he said, I, I said, you know, why are you guys polluting the world with this oil? Why are, we, why are we driving around in circles, driving to Kmart and back, just burning the stuff up? And he goes, you know, you're right. He agreed with me for a change. <laughs> and he said, you know, it's like there's a game of musical chairs and there are a hundred people sitting at the table. And then they get up and they dance around because the music's going. And they're having fun, they're laughing. And it's only when the music stops that they realize that 80 chairs have been taken out of the room. And that really hit me is because 80% of everything we did then and 80% of everything we do now is completely dependent on fossil fuels. That hasn't changed one iota since 1979. We're still using the same amount. It's just that we've run out of room to dump our waste into the atmosphere. So we're warming the planet. Um, so next slide, please. I asked him, what's plan B? He said, there is no plan B. So I decided to go look for plan B. And I started going to the wildest places I could find where nature had been driven into a corner. This is me up in the Northwest Passage, 450 miles above the Arctic Circle. Next slide, please. And to document what I could of the remaining wild places on the planet and the remaining wild cultures that are still with us. And I've been spending most of my career in places like this on the ice flows of the Northwest Passage. Next slide, please. And I have been traveling with plan B, cultures that have stood the test of time. If, if the success of a culture can be measured over the, its longevity, then I think the Inuit culture here, these are the polar Inuit in Northern Greenland, the northernmost people on the planet, They've been living there for 10,000 years in, in harmony with their surroundings. They have discovered something about living on the planet in a sustainable way that we have yet to learn. So I have gone as, as often as I can to travel with people like Ilongwak, who's an Inuit hunter. Um, these people 
They know all about automobiles and snowmobiles and powerboats, but they refuse to use them. They continue to use their 10,000 year old technology because they, A, they know it's sustainable. It will always serve them come what may. And they don't have to get involved with the consumer culture to pay for things that they can't afford. So they choose to be free and continue to live the way they did in harmony with their landscape, the way their ancestors did. So that's what's driven me. And next slide, please. No. There, there we go. okay. So in my quest for answers for plan B, I've literally gone to the last, the end of the last frontier. Um, this is Tektovic, Alaska. It's on an island off the north coast of Alaska. It's literally within the Nash Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, but it, Alaska is the self-styled last frontier. Well, this is beyond the last frontier. This is the last place. Um, and we have driven nature into a corner here where these bears are surviving on the remains of the Inupiat bowhead whale hunt. And that's the only thing that's keeping them alive because the planet is warming so quickly that the, the sea ice upon which they de depend for their hunting of, um, of seals is coming in later every year and it's going out earlier every year. So there are longer and longer gaps when they have nothing to eat. And the only thing I said, like I said, is keeping them alive is this, um, is the remains of the, uh, the Inupiat bowhead whale hunt. And those are the, the images that you'll see in the gallery. Um, so that's, that's my story. And um, I'm really glad you're here. Thanks for coming. So we thought it would be um, interesting to take some of the pairings that are the exhibition and uh, give Ed and Steve a chance to speak to them. Um, so you can hear the inner workings of their minds um, in relation to this body of work, which is, uh, we are so grateful for it coming here. Um, Ed and Steve brought this, uh, sent a proposal to our prior director, Brian Kennedy, to say, we're really interested in, in doing this. They knew Brian and thought it would be a great fit with Pam. And so then Brian reached out to Trevor and myself, and that's, that's where it all began in the fall of 2019. <laughs> and then all kinds of things happened, um, but we persevered and, and through that have had this extraordinary relationship with both of you, at, you know, unfolding over this volatile time. Um, and so that's where, we're, that's where we're coming from. That's what uh, allowed us to be able to present this exhibition at PAM. And so if we could have the first pairing of slides and, uh, and then we'll be able to um, yeah. speak to what, what you will see but may not have gotten the background on. Do you wanna, do you wanna start this off, Trevor? So, um, Steve, why don't, one, why don't you tell us uh, a little bit about um, how how you came to get this this particular shot um, with the polar bear kind of prowling in front of the, the sure um, yeah um, <clears throat> so this is a photograph that I call overshoot and the term overshoot means that we have overshot our the planet's capacity to support us um, and. These are giant whale bones here that um, are almost incredible. They're, the way, bowhead whales are like 70 feet long and they weigh tons and tons. And I was able to get close to this bear as it was walking by and I caught it looking directly at me. It was boring, its eyes were boring right into me. And I was like almost taken aback. I was like so shocked because the bear was communicating a real message. It was saying, look at what you've done. How could you have done this to me? And I, I had that, that 
that the, the photograph as you see it. And then when Mary and I went to see a gallery show of Ed's, I saw the same creature and his eyes were boring in at me saying, what have you done? And that's when I, I got the idea that we, we needed to get our work together. And so that's the story behind these two images as from my perspective. The pairings were serendipitous to begin with, mm -hmm. where you stumbled across the show I was having. Yeah, that small gallery in Vermont. And uh, we basically were unaware of each other's work and, uh, and concerns. And somehow the pairings just fell into place, especially the gaze, the look, the boring into the spectator's eyes and the pathos and the uh, tragedy of a situation where collapse was everywhere. <clears throat> I mean, Jared Diamond has informed me quite a lot and about just societal collapse and ecocide and the general uh, way in which we have made our bed, so to speak. So all of the detritus of civilization, uh, he inspired to some degree by him, but also it fits perfectly with your work. And uh, quite by chance, I and mean, no, there was no plan. It was just right. uh, serendipity, really. And um, so the, but the look, the gaze, the fact that these are alive, but they're dead. They're semi conscious, uh, semi, um, oh, what's the word? Um, well, they're, they're, they're aware of what's going on, but they're not. They're puzzled. They're frightened. They're they're basically us in a, in a kind of standing way, and um, and this is where cartooning and caricature and satire all come together with the two sides of tragedy, comedy. I mean, what's comic about this? There is nothing comic about it, but there's some. Uh, be, the word amusement has been used a lot for these drawings, and uh, I, I don't think it's quite accurate, but it's, uh, it's just fear, puzzlement, uh, uncertainty. It's all what we're feeling ourselves today, and add that to a political crisis as well, and we have a storm of, of anxiety and difficulty. Comedy, of course, can be something that's very dark too. And dark, yes. Um, you know the the Kentridge quote that you gave. Um, there's a there's another quote in that book where that comes from, and it's from Michel de Montaigne, the um, mm. the French Enlightenment philosopher, who's talking about this this idea that it's more damning to laugh than to cry. Yeah, <laughs> and in this case, it's true. We have the next yeah. slide. Um, so would be great, Ed, for, for you to speak a little bit about where these drawings come from. There, that's a, a place of such juxtaposition yeah. with Steve's work. Well, it, it's a, that's the most difficult question of all to ask. And I often say, well, it comes from this. I mean, it, and in some, feckless way, it's true. I mean, my, my process is such that I just start doodling. And I start with the eyes, mostly, with the gaze, with the look, the, the, the emotion. And as the drawing progresses, I have no idea where it's going, really. It's, uh, it develops in its own sweet way, and sometimes painful way, but mostly uh, uh, kind of encouraging way, that the drawing is encouraging me in a way that I, I'm perfectly unaware of. And sometimes I hit roadblocks and I have to go backwards and forwards. And, but there's always a sense that it will develop into something. And if it doesn't, then it takes a walk. But uh, if not, I've been really lucky that somehow I've been able to resolve the idea, the drawing, the structure, the composition, the tonality, all of this, which I look for in, you know, in a technical way. Uh, I mean, it's, a lot of it is, has to do 
was of course a melding of subject and, and technique, but a lot of it is technique. I like, like, where's this? And the funny, subtle engagement between one and the other. And I'm always surprised when it's done uh, or when I think it's done. It's never done, but it's, uh, you know, I, one has to make one's peace with, with the drawing. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's the short answer. <laughs> and um, Steve, with this, this image was one of the ones that stuck with me when I first saw your proposal. Okay. It was a haunting image mm -hmm. for me that I couldn't erase from my head. That's and the intention. It, you're right. <laughs> and that's what told me that, you know, that the fact that it was holding me that way, like I was carrying it with me after looking at it just on a screen, that there was a there was an impact there that we would do well to, to explore. And so I was curious this moment for you and how this kind of exemplifies your experience in, in Kaktovic. Yes, and, and elsewhere. Um, just wanted to get up and take a look at it myself. Um, am I blocking anybody? Okay, great. Um, yeah, um, this gets back to, well, first of all, a lot of photographers would not take this shot. This is not a pristine shot of wild nature. This is, this is a little polar bear cub tangled in wire at the far edge of the last frontier. And that's, that's what we've, this is where we've driven nature to. I mean, this is off the North coast of Alaska in the Arctic Ocean. And this poor bear is, is struggling to disentangle itself from wire that was on the bottom of the, the, the lagoon. Um, so, Rather than avert my gaze and look for something that is more emblematic of untouched, pristine nature, I force myself to look at these scenes, probably very much like a war photographer would, to bear witness to what's actually happening out there, as opposed to trying to bring back feel-good photographs of what, what might have been, as opposed to what is. And so, it's hard for me to, to actually, I was actually there watching this poor cub, um, but perhaps a little bit of what I was feeling, you might feel in just seeing the image and um, empathizing with the, the poor thing and understanding its struggle and perhaps wondering what the future holds for it. So that was really what was going through my mind when I saw this scene. Um, you know, to really focus on it and tell the tell the story that I was that, tell the story that I was being given, as opposed to the story that I wanted to construct. And I think that that's really what I tend to do now. That um, you know, I have spent so much time in places that are under attack. Uh, that it, the temptation is to just go and have adventures and come back and say everything is fine, but in reality, it's not, and you have to tell the truth. So. That's the story behind this image. And I think it's a, it's a really interesting example of where you are coming from this as a documentarian. Mm -hmm. And with Ed, mm -hmm. you are being guided by your unconscious and your imagination. Mm -hmm. And so to find the, the, that moment of conversation mm -hmm. coming from such different places is, was a really a special thing for Trevor and I to be involved in. And basically, and what I've concocted too is based on what Steve has chronicled and and made clear and real. I mean, I would not know about all these situations without your work and that of others who have really have documented it all. I mean, it would be unknown to me. So um, my hat. Thank, well, thank you, you for that. <laughs> Shall we go to the next slide? Yeah. Cycle of documenting, bearing witness, the way that that then fires the imagination in, in, in uh, other ways. Um, one of the things that uh, I, I think you and I, Janie, like, uh, in the middle of COVID when we were on like trying to pick the works and we're on screen and 
um, and yeah, finding hold, holding things up in front of the camera. <laughs> Can you see this, Trevor? <laughs> sort of. <laughs> but um, you know, over over that process, and then and then through finally being being able to sit down in a large with a very very large table together, begin to kind of map out these these um, visual juxtapositions that we kind of felt contained these these tensions that you guys are 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 both talking may I, about. May I add that that there are not two artists here, but there are four. Yeah. And Janie and Trevor and their engagement and creativity and putting these together, these pairings and seeing how they interconnect and how <clears throat> both formally uh, and contextually. Uh, this is all part of the process, and it's, it, without you guys, this would not have the uh, force and power that it that it does. Can we have the next slide, please. So, one of the one of the things that um, we touched on earlier was this kind of idea that. Um, you know, both your bears, Steve, and, and your creatures, Ed, are, in a way, our stand-ins. These are all, in a very fundamental way, pictures of us mm. and where we're at. Um, maybe this, this is one where... Um, Perhaps it's it's getting in into kind of a psychological area, which is about you know the consideration of our mortality. And I wonder if you'd like to address that. I mean, there's other ones that talk about you know the kind of perpetuation of the species, mm -hmm. uh, uh, parents and children. But there's also this pair, which is really. Mm -hmm. um, you know, alas, poor Yorick. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> well, in my case, I've always been interested in body language in general, in, in everything I draw and the, the kind of fluidity and, and how the, that is an element of really complex expression. And this particular drawing is the most extreme version of that. Uh, not to say that the others are, have, are absent of it, but uh, this, is almost a, the most extreme version of using the structure and the body and the gesture to express the frustration, anger, perplexity of, of everything. It's very clear. It's, it's not quite as um, engaged in a complex way as some of the earlier drawings, but, but somehow this, this for me is the, is the expresses the frustration and the, and, and the tragedy, look at the dead creatures, like my friends, what, what, what's going on here? What are you doing to us? And on, you know, so you can read. I mean, I, I hate to interpret my own work because there's so much I really want to be interpreted by anybody other than me. Uh, but it's, it's uh, this, this one is the simplest, most direct expression of this frustration and rage, I feel. And it's paired with an image that maybe if you don't know the backstory here, um, I feel like kind of Ed's drawing helps you to think about your photograph differently in this case, because mm -hmm. if I don't know about the bear's plight, mm -hmm. I'm looking at a group of bears, I see water, I see snow. Mm -hmm. um, but tell us what's happening here. Okay. Excuse me, and, and I, I have to second what Ed just said about having four artists on the, on, the, on the team here because these two have brought out so many more things in my work than I knew was in there. So <laughs> it's, it's like, wow, really? I did that? <laughs> um, but no, uh, of course, I was there without Jeannie and Trevor over my shoulder, you know, telling me what to shoot. But um, so this is a, this is a it, it, it looks like a benign scene, but it's actually tragic. 
Um, here are four mother polar bears stranded on the shore of a little spit off the north coast of Alaska. It's early October. The first snow has fallen, but the sea ice should have already formed two or three weeks ago, at least. They shouldn't be stuck on this little sand spit, looking out to sea, waiting for the sea ice to form so they can get off. They're stranded, they're castaways, they're climate refugees. They're the walking dead. If it weren't for those whale bones and the gristle and you know remains that the Inupiat drag out there to tide them over, they wouldn't be alive. Um, so they're just standing there, literally waiting, like castaways watching for a sail on the horizon. That's pretty much what you're seeing there. So we have one more pair, Janie, but that you can yeah. you can you can speak to. But just just to say that after this pairing, we're going to open it up to mm -hmm. you to ask uh, questions. Yeah, so the last pair and um, the next slide, um, these are super graphics that are in the exhibition. Um, we were so excited to have the opportunity to blow these works mm. up and asked uh, both Ed and Steve if, if they would mind if we did that to, in the hopes of having people feel like they were part yeah. of, <coughs> of the image instead of just observers and actually invite them to take, take their pictures with it and, and post it to uh, the hashtag for the exhibition. Um, so did you, either of you want to say anything though about these works as you, as you see them in the show at this you know, much larger scale than you generally have the opportunity to show them at? Well, I, yeah, I mean, the scale really makes a difference in terms of impact <clears throat> and force. And um, it makes the meaning clearer in a way because it, the detail is a lot more accessible <clears throat> and when, than if they're smaller. Uh, I, I love it and because it, it, a, the surface gets so much more animated and uh, it really graphically and meaningfully wonderful. Yeah, yeah I, I feel the same way. I'm, excuse me, I, I've never had a print made to 12 feet before. <laughs> this is, I, when I walked in there, I was stunned. It was like, whoa, that's amazing. And by the way, they, they did such a nice job with the exhibition. The, the, the paint behind the, the mural is just so subtle. It looks like you can just walk right into the picture. Mm -hmm. And that's really the, the sensation I come away with even when I go in there. And, and that, I think that's, that's the intention is to, is, to, is to put yourself in the picture and, and, and see the details and, and get close to it. Um, I call this one Terminus, the end of the frontier myth. And it's to emphasize the, the fact and the point that we have reached the end. Um, we can't continue any longer. Um, this, is, this is the result of our, our experiment. Um, and the, the results are in and the, the conclusions are not good. And I think that in both of these cases, um, at this size and scale, it's, you're pretty much confronted with those results, it's pretty un undeniable. The detail is there. One thing more I want to add about the size of this is it's like a choreography. It's like a, <clears throat> this, these, by extending and expanding the size of these creatures and it accentuates their movement and they become dancers in a funny way to their own death and demise. So it, it has a kind of, um, middle, almost medieval sense of the clattering of bones and uh, the sound of the end, time, end of time. Um, so we do wanna make sure to uh, open this up as a moment for you all to be asking what you would like to know about. Um, and we're gonna pass over a mic. Um, so that everyone can hear you uh, as, as you're asking the question. So anyone want to be the first in this to jump in?
Hi, Ed. Was there a particular event that led to the shift? Yeah, you're good. Was there a particular event that led to this new subject matter? Um, yes and no. I mean, I started reading. The more, more we have all become aware of what we're, this new phase of, that we're in, climate and disaster. I started reading about haphazardly almost. Elizabeth Colbert was one book that I read with some interest. Um, Bill McKibben, of course, uh, was always in the vanguard of thinking about this. And I read his work a fair amount. Uh, and then I advanced into more granular and more scientific work like ben, uh, David Wallace Wells book uh, on the unsustainable earth. Um, so, and that morphed into this. And I've always been drawing creatures of one sort or another, and for various reasons and with various purposes, because I have a friendship with them and, uh, and a delight in them. And they kind of became darker and more bleak as time went, as the more I was reading. And then now Jared Diamond started to make me think about ruins. <clears throat> and uh, there was a book I did read about ruins that uh, talked about how over time we have experienced one disaster after another. So in terms of our civilizations rising and then falling. Um, and it all became part and parcel of a piece that I couldn't sort out. Like, this is where it began and this or the, not. It just uh, kind of slowly, relentlessly developed into this and uh, without intention, really. Thank you. So yes, if you ID another person up there. And just while that's being passed over, there is a QR code in the exhibition where you can access all the resources that Ed and Steve felt have been really influential in, in their work, which are books mm -hmm. as well as websites. And so that's a that's a great resource to check when you're in there. So I'm interested in, is this on? I'm interested in sort of this interplay of witness to um, the disaster and the creative response and, and this interaction of this time and whether you see other ways in which, um, you know, the overwhelm of witnessing to what is happening and the um, kind of frozenness that one can experience in that place or, or you know just being overwhelmed if you see um if you can speak a little bit to the sort of creative um energy of this talk and where it might um, go on a larger level to help human beings to uh to help us to um, sustain what we need to in terms of um, confronting um, and take this where you will. Hmm. Well, this... I'll, I'll tackle that one first. Um, I think it probably deserves two responses, but um, so it's, it's, a, it's a meta problem. It's so big that we can't get our hands around it. It's, you, you try to do one thing and you, you mess something else up. It's, it, it just isn't gonna work. Um, and there are no technical solutions to this, by the way, as much as people are, are saying that there are. The kind of thinking that got us into this situation is not likely to get us out. This is not gonna happen. So we have to change the way we live and we have to change our economies and we have to change our consumption. We have to recognize the fact that we live on a planet of finite resources that cannot support us as we try to um, exploit them indefinitely. It's just, that's physically impossible. And so a mature response might be to recognize that, that we're depleting all of the things that sustain life on the planet. 
and we're doing it at an exponential rate, faster and faster and faster. And yet we demand 3% growth at a minimum every year for our economies. Well, take that out a few years. It's 30, you know, it'll be the economy will be 30 times larger than it is now. Where are the resources gonna to come to support that? Where's the room gonna come from? Where, well, we're gonna add 85 million people to the planet this year alone. Another Germany every single year, fine. But how are they gonna be supported? Where's the farmland? Where's the topsoil? Where's the biodiversity? Where is the carbon sink? It's just not there. And I think the first reaction is to say, <clears throat> okay, this isn't working anymore. So that's why I went looking for plan B. And I think, you know, not to leave you with, you know, the fact that this is, there is no solution. There are answers out there. It says that we have to be willing to accept them. Accept them. We have to be willing to look at other ways of living that have been successful over time, that don't destroy their, inhabit, their habitat, that are sustainable, and are actually joyful and purposeful ways of, life, of living. And, um, you know, the people I travel with up in the Arctic or other indigenous cultures in the subarctic, they're the happiest people I've ever been with. Why? They have so much less than we have. It's like, I guess they have more of the things that really matter. So that would be my answer. Well, my answer is pretty much yours. Uh, but the question came to me yesterday while I was looking in, in the mission, there's some two round tables with uh, notebooks and children, young people have written in these notebooks. And I was perusing it yesterday just by chance. And what they all, without fail, talk about these kids, what they will miss. They'll miss walking in the woods. They'll miss the experience of being on a lake with their parents. Now, all these are natural phenomena that they have come to expect and to be part of their lives. And they are anxious that this is going to go away. Uh, and so it leads to the question, the big question is often asked, do you have any hope? <clears throat> Where's the hope here? Um, and it's clear that it is a very iffy question to answer. Uh, and it's just um, hard to, I mean, we go, I go back to what you were saying, we're, we're, we're at an impasse. And uh, the only thing I, where hope kind of rises in my brain is a is referring back to an article that was published in Harper's maybe a year ago, in which the author uh, kind of sounds the bugle of a, of a sustained effort on, akin to a world war to solve this problem that we all are engaged and we all take this as a existential situation. I can't think of any other reason any other solution, nor can anybody else. It's a, it's a tragedy. And uh, there's not, uh, I have no answer. I'm an amateur, I just, I'm a scrivener. You know, what can I, what do I know? But, uh, you know, that's the best I can come up with. Just tag on, if you don't mind, with, um, we didn't want to be leaving people feeling empty. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, like we just wrung them out. Um, and so we actually have a exhibition that's opening uh, in the middle of April that will then totally overlap with Down to the Bone called Climate Action Inspiring Change. And it is an exhibition that's really focused on the solutions that are already known um, because so many people are wondering, well, what do we do? Just like you were saying. And there is actually a great deal that's already known including the indigenous knowledge and practices uh, that are folded into that show. So um, we hope you'll come back and experience that as well as um, taking this out of just as they were saying, mm -hmm. the sort of collective, the amplifying of the individual will be absolutely essential. Uh, we cannot be doing this as mm -hmm. individuals. We have to be doing it uh, in a collective systemic uh, pattern and 
starting with talking about it, talking about it so that people realize that there's other folks um, that have concerns and that from there things can happen, but not if we don't open the door to the conversation. So just wanted to add that. Yeah. Um, and then maybe um, we're at two o'clock, but would love to hear if there's any, another person who wants to uh, ask a question before we wrap things up. You're all set. <laughs> <laughs> That's not really a fair statement, but. Uh, I wonder if it's a good okay. couple over there. Oh. Um, um, I really appreciated the, the gaze that you were talking about. And I felt the gaze of the whale as well, because the gaze, the whale itself is, has a gaze that's gone as we will be. Um, but I, I, I've heard um, people make the distinction between um, protecting habitat and solving climate change. As if the two can be separate, that, that, that climate change is basically a done deal and there's really not much we can do about it, but that we can preserve habitat. And I'm curious to know, can those be separated, do you think, to any degree that makes sense? Is that, is that a, a worthwhile distinction or is it not really? I, I'm certainly happy to answer that. <clears throat> I think that's the problem, is that um, people see climate change as the problem, but it's not the problem. It's a symptom of a larger problem. The larger problem is overshoot. The larger problem is systemic. Climate change is one of a number of symptoms along with deforestation, biodiversity loss, habitat loss, ocean acidification, soil depletion, atmospheric pollution, you name it, the list is so long. And climate change is just one of those things. Um, so you can't solve climate change in, in isolation. You can't solve any of these things in isolation from each other. They're all interconnected. And I think that that's what, if we adopted a more holistic worldview that is more characteristic of indigenous cultures that have survived over time, they see the interconnectedness of all things. And they aren't seeing things in isolation. They're not trying to solve one thing because they know that if you just focus on one thing, you're gonna do damage somewhere else. So for example, trying to come up with technical solutions to climate change, sucking carbon out of the air. <clears throat> well, how are you gonna build those machines? They're gonna require vast amounts of iron ore and steel. You're gonna be mining so much. Mining is the most toxic industry in the world. So how are we gonna produce all these wind turbines and solar panels if we're going into countries where you know, people who don't like us very much control all of the resources that are needed to, to put into those things. And the mining that it takes, the lithium, the cobalt, all those things are in pristine landscapes, like the high Andes in Chile. And, you know, all that is gonna do is it's going to tear up all that landscape, kick out the people who live there so we can build these machines. So you can't solve climate change in isolation from saving the, the people who live there and their, their environment, their habitat. These are all interconnected. Everything we do has a, con a cost, a consequence. And every solution, however well intended, you know, there are unintended consequences. So that's how I see it. Does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, the climate change focus is, is not, it's not, the, it's not the big part of the problem. And it's not helpful. It's actually a distraction. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, well, Trevor said, oh, I have the mic. You don't have a mic anymore. <laughs> <laughs> <Power is> my... <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Just to uh, thank you all. Uh, I could feel all of you hanging on every word of Ed and Steve's. Um, uh, and you you are um, exuding my feeling of just every time I'm in your presence, and I know Trevor feels the same way, we come away uh, knowing more than we did the last mm. time we saw you. And uh, so it's, 
It's really been an incredible privilege to be here today mm. with you and with all of you. Um, and thank you for joining us and thank you for allowing yourselves to be vulnerable in that exhibition, which is really where we all have to be starting is to, to really witness, you know, to be mm. witnesses um, and feel that. So thank you for being here, all the distance you've traveled and to being part of the conversation with us today. So wonderful to have you all here. Thank you. Okay, next, next is downstairs. 